A very, very big change that we have in the Middle Ages is the religious change when we're talking about Europe in the Middle East. We have other changes, most notably the fall of the Western Roman Empire and so on, that are also very important, the arrival of so-called barbarian peoples, etc. Uh, but uh, that did not directly influence the gender roles in the society so much. Maybe it emphasized the military culture once again, but it was fairly strong in the antiquity as well. But we have uh, the transfer to monotheistic religion as at first dominant and then soon the only allowed religion in the society. So if we just take a century while Rome still existed from the early 4th century to the early 5th, from the moment where Christianity was an allowed religion to the point where Christianity became the only allowed religion, that's a very, very big difference in the way of thinking of that society. And we could say similar things about Islam in the Middle East. So... Uh, generally, yes, the antiquity was dominantly pagan, but paganism wasn't a single religion. There were many, many different cults and religions and various aspects uh, of the worship of a single god or a single pantheon that changed from place to place that had their local peculiarities. Yes, there was still the Jewish community, which was monotheistic, at that time, and that was the only seriously monotheistic religion in the antiquity. Yes, there was Akhenaten's attempt in Egypt, there was the cult of Mithras in Rome as something as resembling a monotheism, but let's not dwell on that. <clears throat> Generally, uh, Christianity and Islam both made a very, very... Um, big claim on social justice and on the equality of everyone before God. So you probably know the famous quote from the Bible. I'm sorry if I uh, misquote it, I'm paraphrasing, but there sh shall be no man nor woman, no master or slave, etc. before God. So we are all God's children and we are equal in that sense. Uh, nobody's social status in the society on this earth matters in the eyes of God. It matters who we are as a person, as a soul, etc. On the one hand, that brings a step forwards for women in many societies. So, uh, at least from a certain point of view, religion views women as equal to men, which was until then most frequently not the case except Egypt. There are also some theories that are interesting for the antiquity that many other cults in Mesopotamia, in Greece, etc., were probably more egalitarian at first because we have pairs of gods and goddesses uh, in charge of the same domain of human life, but that gradually as society changed, the male god became prominent and the woman only uh, his uh, consort, his helper, but obviously less important. Now, some people would say that it's the same in the Abrahamic religions, that God is very distinctly male, and the only... Uh, prominent woman of a similar status is the Virgin Mary as the mother of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, however, uh, we still have, despite that um, presumable equality of all believers before God, we still have very, very distinct different social roles for men and women. And uh, they are expected to fulfill those roles and men behaving in a feminine manner or women behaving in a masculine manner uh, leads to judgment of the society, even if it's not something that's strictly illegal, it is frowned upon because they are viewed as acting contrary to their nature. Now, unfortunately, 
uh, the Roman lawyers left a long-lasting legacy of opinions that women are not only, say, physically weaker or more emotional, for which we could say now that there is some scientific basis, at least generally, statistically speaking, but also that women are less intelligent, that women are simply unable to comprehend all the social pe peculiarities of law and politics that men can, that they cannot be educated as scientists, etc., uh, and that women are less capable of generally controlling their behavior. So they're not just more emotional in the sense that they feel things more distinctly, <laughs> but that they are less able to control their emotions. So man is more ra rational, woman irrational. And so they're not just two different spheres, but they are two spheres where one is envisioned as obviously superior to the other. And that naturally becomes a problem in practice and is reflected in different ways in different societies. Now, again, we have so selected several to <clears throat> give you some examples. So on the one hand, we have the surviving eastern half of the Roman Empire, usually known in modern scholarship as the Byzantine Empire, though they did not use that term for themselves, they still called themselves Romans, except now they spoke Greek because it was the eastern half of the empire. So it's sometimes referred to as the Romaean Empire because Romeo was the Greek word for Romans. Mm -hmm. They are generally considered traditionally a mix of Roman law, Greek culture, and Christianity. And we see the elements of all that in uh, the Romanian law. So generally the position of women is pretty good. They have full legal capacity. They have the same inheritance rights as men uh, as starting from Justinianic law. We even have in the Romanian Empire some empresses who ruled in their own right. And although they also sometimes resorted to some masculine symbolism, for example, minting coins where they said of themselves emperor, not empress, because empress would be an emperor's wife, it did not go to such extent as with Hatshepsut in Egypt. Uh, so uh, generally... Uh, in um, regular legal um, interactions, women had the same rights as men, and the so society was fairly egalitarian in that respect. Um, however, naturally, in this period, generally, we still have to take class into account. Uh, and socially still the men were dominant in the sense that the man was usually uh, the head of the family uh, and the social mores were such that women knew that they uh, sometimes uh, found it easier to uh, have their way even when they were perfectly capable of governing their own business if they uh, posed as poor women who needed the protection of men. So we see women in courts litigating normally, uh, but they present their, their cases as, oh, I am a poor defenseless woman on my own. Please, judge, take pity on me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, uh, where we still have obvious uh, differences, that's the public sphere. So while we do have some ruling empresses, and generally, of course, female members of the imperial family were influential even when they didn't take the throne in their own right. Uh, most of the positions at court could only be occupied uh, by men. Uh, generally, it's interesting in the later mi Middle Ages when Byzantium comes into conflict with the Crusaders, with Western Europe, that the uh, Westerners perceive uh, Byzantines as effeminate because they're not a warrior culture. They're not strong and loud and showing off their masculinity. They are some uh, guys in fancy clothing who are all uh, so very nurtured and uh, 
they look unmasculine by their standards, but the Byzantines also perceive the coming crusaders as very effeminate because they are not in control of themselves. So they, they are all running around and shouting and publicly ex uh, showing all their emotions. They're like little girls. So we have different standards of masculinity and femininity in Europe at the time, and a lot of the cultural clash comes from it. This is not strictly legal uh, discourse, but it affects even legal interactions in everyday life. Uh, now again, we still have a very pronounced dichotomy regarding sexual crimes. While the Christian church now insists on the fact that both spouses have to be faithful to each other and adultery is a sin uh, regardless of who commits it and fornication is also a, a sin. So the only way to have sexual intercourse, whichever sex you are, is in valid marriage. Uh, Still, the law only um, uh, really strictly punishes uh, the adultery of women, um, while uh, there are various uh, complications from Constantine on, where we have the prohibition of marriage by abduction. And it's very interesting to follow the evolution of that, but we don't have the time now, so maybe if someone's interested in discussion. But that is, in this period, uh, a more dominantly... A crime seen as a threat than rape, for example. Uh, and yes, naturally, we can see why, because a woman is abducted and forced to marry someone, but uh, particularly in the times of war, in times of uh, social insecurity, apparently uh, such offenses were relatively frequent, though sometimes, of course, it was merely elopement, so uh, a man that the woman falls in love with but that her parents don't approve of supposedly abducting the young woman so they, that they could marry. Uh, someone suggested some books in the chat, and I am grateful for, for that, so we shall uh, look up those books. They are in Serbian, but uh, they will be interesting, at least to the majority of our listeners. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing that we have in Byzantium and that we did have in uh, Middle Eastern societies too are eunuchs. Uh, so those are, as you know, men who were castrated usually on purpose so that they could not have children. Sometimes, of course, that was a result of an accidental injury and so on. But usually uh, uh, eunuchs were made on purpose because there were some positions, particularly at the court in the imperial palace, that were reserved only for eunuchs after a while because they were considered uh, to be free of any uh, sexually ignited passions that could otherwise corrupt uh, whole men and that they also could have no progeny that they could conspire for, so they could not, for example, be um, an opponent who was going to scheme to take the throne, because the emperor had to be perfect in mind and body, so a eunuch could not become emperor. Uh, and there's a very... Um, uh, conflicting attitude in Byzantium towards eunuchs, because on the one hand, they are seen as angelic, as sinless, choirs of eunuchs uh, were very praised for their performance, and that's what led uh, later to the practice of castrati opera singers in the West. Uh, but on the other hand, they were seen as less than men, as maimed in some way, and since they were mostly there in the court uh, and politics, although they could not scheme for their progeny, of course they could scheme for various other reasons, so generally the image of the uh, sly, scheming, cheating eunuch doing some sort of 
uh, court intrigue was also imprinted very much in the culture and we still have it in Game of Thrones, etc. Uh, so, but legally speaking, uh, it's interesting that uh, for a while, for a long while, eunuchs were not allowed either to marry or to adopt children because they simply uh, could not perform marital duties and have children on their own, but later they were allowed to adopt. Moving on as Eastern as we'll get, and then we'll make a circle towards the West. Mm. Uh, we have the Arabian Caliphates and the changes that Islam brought there, just like Christianity changed ancient Rome. So in uh, the Arabian tribes prior to Islam, generally uh, the society was very gender segregated. Women were subjected to men in the sense of being considered their property. Uh, so uh, for example, whoever inherited the property of a deceased man would also inherit his wives. It wasn't even a uh, leveret marriage, it was simply the closest male relative that he had would also get the wives, and so on. Islam improved the position of women tremendously, uh, so for the first time uh, women get rights both in the private and, to a lesser extent, uh, in the public sphere. Now, as we all know, Islam preserves the practice of polygyny, so polygamic marriage, which allows a man to have multiple wives, but now it is limited up to four wives if it's a free man, up to two if it's a slave, so even a slave man can have two wives. Uh, but uh, the Quran says that uh, the man has to be able to take care of his wives in a material sense according to his station. Uh, so it is um, regarding the wealth that that man has, uh, it can be judged whether he has the means to support another wife or not. And Sheikh Riban will probably know that better than me, but that's even nowadays, the reason why some very rich businessmen from some uh, Islamic countries go to marry their second or third wife abroad so they wouldn't have to um, meet that quota. Uh, now, generally, uh, women were allowed to uh, do the things that men did. Uh, they gained their uh, legal capacity, but they were considered less worthy. So that's why the, I pose the question, is a woman worth half a man? Because we see the recurring scheme, uh, for example, in court, when witnesses are brought out for whatever civil or criminal case, women can testify, but the testimony of two women is considered equal to the testimony of one man. Women can inherit, but a woman, regardless of whether she... Uh, inherits as a daughter or other type of relative or as a wife, inherits half of the share that a man would uh, inherit in her case. So, for example, if a man dies and he has a son and a daughter, they won't get half his property each, the son will get two-thirds and the daughter one-third. But that applies to the entire property, including immovable property, and that is again very progressive for this era. In most medieval societies, we'll see women cannot or can very rarely uh, inherit immovable property, and that's particularly progressive for a society uh, that used to treat women themselves as property until recently. So Muhammad really brought a revolution in this respect. <clears throat> now, regarding female virtue, there's still the same attitude that a woman's virtue is primarily sexual as in other societies of the time. And again, similar to the ancient societies, there's a crime called Zina, which is both uh, an amalgamation of what we'd call adultery with what we would call uh, fornication. 
it, the penalties are more severe in the case of adultery. But what is interesting is that at least on paper, Sharia law treats men and women equally in this respect. So men and women are both prohibited from uh, zina regardless of whether they are married or not, and it's only their marital sta status that should determine uh, the severity of the punishment. However, in practice, in many Islamic societies, women are more uh, frequently persecuted for zina, and generally we can't say that their status is overall equal because uh, even if we say that they are punished the same way for adultery, a uh, woman still has only one husband, while a man can have up to four wives and he can legally have concubines, unlike a woman. Can I just add one mm -hmm. small remark? Uh, just an example on um, how religion can contribute to improvement of position of women when the religion deems a woman worthy and beneficial to the religion. I'm just going to give two examples in uh, Byz Byz uh, Byzantium. Um, women gain the same inheritance rights as men, and uh, the church wholeheartedly supported that because it, in practice, women, when they were widowed and had no children, they would leave mostly their property to the church. So it was in church's interest that women have the same inheritance rights, so of course, they can make a sort of a profit on it. Uh, in case of Islam, uh, Islam saw women as... Uh, when Islam emerged, it, it really had to fight its way for existence. Muhammad really had a, a tough time and the whole history of the rise of Islam. So Islam saw women also as equal fighters to men for spreading Islam. And that's also one of the reasons why Islam bettered the position of women. So they can be um, loyal to Islam, call it that way, and also uh, help men spread the faith on the territory. So just two small remarks. And it's similar to how Christianity spread well. in Rome initially, because many early Christians were women who then spread the religion in their households, etc. And the fact that the Christian religion allowed women to have uh, um, positions of relative authority and respect as nuns, etc., was also something that was an improvement at the time. Um, now, we can't focus on individual countries, but generally we'll do Eastern and then Western Europe. Uh, so there's this term coined by Dmitry Obolensky, uh, Byzantine Commonwealth for the Eastern European Orthodox countries that were influenced by the Romanian Empire. So a lot of uh, their laws, including ours, medieval Serbian law, was heavily influenced by the law of Byzantium, which means developed later Roman law with a lot of Christian influences. Uh, and that generally meant a fairly good position of women. So in most uh, Slavic laws, the laws of Eastern Europe, women did have full legal capacity. Now, whether they actually owned property or not, whether they could inherit varied, uh, both from the country and period in question, and unfortunately from our interpretation of the sources, because sometimes, for example, in Serbia in Dushan's code, the phrasing is such that we cannot be sure whether women inherited uh, equally with their male relatives, or it was implied that male relatives had the priority and that women only inherited if they did not have brothers or other relatives of the same degree, for example. Mm. Now, uh, generally, uh, in many of these countries, a married woman could still have her property that was separate from her husband's. So whatever she brought into marriage as dowry stayed hers. The husband could not sell it, although he had the right to use his wife's dowry. Uh, but generally, it does not seem to be 
uh, traditional for Slavic countries to give out big valuable dowries to daughters when they marry. So traditionally, particularly when there was still no distinct noble class that was very rich, a woman would bring as dowry her personal belongings. So her clothes, jewelry, things that she would uh, have for personal use and for use in the household. She'd also frequently do some handiworks that she'd bring as gifts to her husband and her husband's family. Now that could vary in value very much depending on her status. So if she was a poor peasant woman, she'd own a few dresses that she embroidered herself and some pieces of jewelry with of with no particular monetary value. If she was a rich noblewoman, of course, she'd have many, many dresses and valuable golden jewelry, gems, etc. Uh, but uh, generally, so it was more that personal belongings and the practice of giving land as dowry or uh, big sums of money in cash only came later with foreign influence. And that, again... Um, broadened the distinction between women of uh, lower and higher classes. For example, there's a famous example in 13th century Serbia that some of our students might know from the Žiča charters, where essentially uh, the king was trying to help the church enforce the ecclesiastical rules for marriage, which were not always obeyed uh, by the population that had been used in customary law, that marriage was just a contract that could be made, and then if the couple no longer wanted to stay together for whatever reason, they could easily divorce. Now the church allowed only very particular grounds for divorce, the main of which was adultery. There were also some more exotic ones, like one of the spouses tried to kill another or conspired against the emperor and things like that, but how many cases of that would have compared to adultery. Uh, so uh, in this charter, the king imposed some uh, penalties for a person who tried to uh, divorce in an unlawful way, to simply go away or send their spouse away. And for men and women who had property, the penalties were the same. Uh, and they differed according to class, so members of higher social classes also had to pay higher fines because they were richer. Uh, but women who did not have property on their own uh, could be punished corporally, they could be beaten for such an offense, and naturally women from lower classes were much more likely not to have property, or at least not to have that sort of property from which they could pay a really high fine. So once again, sex or gender is not the only factor, class plays a very important role here. <clears throat> what we also have uh, as a very prominent thing is the issue of male honor. Uh, and for example, um, um, male beards and hairs, men wore long hair in the Middle Ages, were considered as important elements of masculine honor. And pulling someone's hair or beard was considered a very grave insult. And once again, in medieval Serbia, in the Code of Emperor Dushan, we have uh, the offense of, for pulling the beard of a nobleman or even of a reputable commoner, punishable by the severing of both hands, which was uh, the punishment for premeditated murder. So you can see that pulling a man's beard, if he was a respectable man, and killing a man was viewed as an equally severe crime. It sounds funny today, but that was their concept of honor in that time. And generally, uh, in many Eastern European laws, uh, women could appear at court in some laws uh, they were limited. For example, in some women could only appear as witnesses uh, in strictly feminine subjects, for example, the question of a girl's virginity or the age of a ch child, things related to childbirth, etc. In some cases, women could appear before court equally with men, but naturally the uh, public roles, the roles of state officials, judges, etc. were reserved to men. 
Now, uh, moving to Western Europe, minus England, we'll have common law separately because it's very different. Uh, we have uh, the collapse of the older system of Roman law and the uh, as you know, various barbarian tribes found their own states. They keep some Roman law for the subjugated Roman population, and it starts influencing them bit by bit, but generally they bring their own tribal customs, uh, which are dominant. And strangely or not so strangely, the customs of many of those Germanic tribes are actually very similar to the early Roman law, in the sense that they also have uh, a very prominent head of family who has control over his wife and children, uh, that his power is called mundium, uh, which is similar to the Roman potestas and is more or less equal to the power of the lower magistrates, while, you know, we also have the imperial power, imperium in Rome and banus in Germanic countries, which was the power of rule over men, so to speak. Uh, and uh, Germanic laws are very, very protective of women and children and such uh, socially endangered groups. Uh, but, uh, for example, we have the case that uh, generally a husband, a father should have mundium over his wife and children, uh, but if a woman stays widowed with the little children, the king has mundium over them. So the king is... Uh, able to enforce, naturally not directly, but through some intermediaries, the rights of the head of family, but it is also his duty to take care of all the widows and orphans in his realm. Uh, we have witnesses in the early times of the times when the barbarians arrived that women also could be warriors, that they fought alongside their men, etc. But as they settle down, as they form uh, more distinct states, generally the military profession is locked uh, as solely masculine. Uh, now, again, female honor and virtue as see, is seen as dominantly sexual, so a woman should be very chaste and modest, and uh, any infringements on her chastity are very severely punished. So we have examples in some of the barbarian codes from the old Black like, Salica to the Gutalag in Iceland in the higher Middle Ages of very uh, detailedly prescribed increasing penalties uh, of any inappropriate act against a woman, and now I don't mean just so, so severe cases such as rape, but I mean if you touch a woman's finger, if you touch her hand, if you touch her upper arm, etc., the penalties increase, if you remove this or that item of her clothing, etc., so the more inappropriate uh, the act is, the higher the fine you pay. Uh, and generally, uh, fines were both in Slavic laws and in Germanic laws were the main uh, uh, criminal penalties for a uh, big part of the Middle Ages. Uh, and so even uh, crimes such as murder were punishable by a fine called Vergeld in uh, many Germanic laws. So literally, man, money, man, gold. So a price you pay for killing a man. Uh, and uh, that was also very socially unequal, so you had to pay twice as much for killing a free barbarian than for killing a free Roman, because Romans are the lower class now, uh, but you paid uh, thrice as much for killing a free barbarian woman if she was of childbearing age. So implicitly, by killing the woman, you killed the chance of her having children. If she was already past childbearing age, the price would be the same as that of a man. If you killed a child, interestingly enough, uh, you paid less than for an adult man. And if you killed a pregnant woman, it was simple math. Woman of childbearing age plus child, that was the, the amount of uh, Vergeld paid. 
So um, generally, um, we have the same inequalities in the punishment of sex crimes and sex crimes, and I won't repeat that because we're running out of time. We should take a break soon. Uh, but what I want to underline is the attitude of the Catholic Church on marriage, uh, which for a long time uh, viewed marriage as uh, yes, a sacred union, but one made between the parties in marriage and God. So there was no need for a priest to act as an intermediator. That was much, much sooner established in the East, in the Orthodox Church, where even the state insisted that marriages had to take place in churches, in public, conducted by a priest with the bishop's blessings, etc. Uh, the Catholic Church came to that relatively late, um, and uh, which meant that clandestine marriages were allowed. So two people could just say their vows to each other with no witnesses present and afterwards claim that they were married and the church acknowledged such a marriage as valid. On the one hand, that doesn't sound so bad. On the other hand, it caused huge problems in practice because some couple would marry in secret because of some reason or another why they wouldn't want to do it in public, usually because one, the family of one of them would disapprove for some reason or because they were from different social strata and the marriage would be humiliating for one of them. And then after a while, one of those spouses would go and get married to someone else in public, and then the remaining spouse would come up and say, no, that marriage is not valid, he is married to me. Well, prove it. Well, we married in secret on that, in that cave over there 10 years ago. So that caused huge headaches for the church. Uh, and it was gradually fighting to do the same thing that the Eastern Church did to make marriages uh, legal only when they are conducted by a priest with at least some public present. <clears throat> and generally, naturally, as you know, in the Catholic Church, priests had to be celibate, unlike uh, the Orthodox Church, where it was the other way around, where a priest has to be married. Uh, both things uh, have the same goal, to ensure the sexual chastity of a priest, and a priest's wife in the Orthodox Church is usually held uh, to somewhat higher standards of conduct uh, than a common woman. She simply has to be beyond any doubt because she is a priest's wife. Uh, while the Catholic Church decided to do away uh, with priests marrying and having any sort of sexual intercourse at all. But then again, that led to uh, different problems because for centuries before that, priests could and did marry and it was customary for priests' sons to become priests in the same parish in turn. And now they all rebelled and it took centuries for that um, to actually become a standard for priests not to have some sort of wife or concubine, at least in secret. Uh, and now, finally, uh, we have the common law, uh, which is in some aspects similar to the other laws in, of Western Europe, particularly the early English law, which is similar to those Germanic laws, but uh, we have... Uh, even from the start, a fairly poor uh, legal standing of women here, uh, that generally a wife is considered not quite the property of her husband, but almost. Uh, we have uh, uh, in some early English legal codes, for example, in the Code of King Alfred, I think, we have the provision uh, that a man who is convicted of uh, adultery has to buy with his own money a replacement wife for the cheated husband. So essentially, the wife is now damaged goods because she slept with another man and the adulterer has to buy you a new wife just like he 
buy a new dog or a new thing of some other sort. Now, we're oversimplifying here. Of course, there was social nuance involved, but the language of the law isn't much different from what I'm telling you here. <clears throat> now, uh, again, in England, uh, there were various kinds of property that a woman could gain through or related to marriage, but gradually that all became uh, transferred to the husband. That was the so-called right of courtesy that you see mentioned there. So it is just common courtesy to give to the husband his wife's dowry. Uh, and uh, generally, a husband had a very broad right to punish his wife for any transgressions against him, adultery included, but not limited to it. Uh, and generally, uh, as long as the, he did not directly endanger her life, that was legal. So he could beat her severely, he could keep her locked uh, in a room on just bread and water, if the magistrate came and saw that, well, she's not in no immediate threat of dying, that was all within his rights as a husband. And generally, uh, we have this quote from William Blackstone, a famous English lawyer. We know that the uh, canon law of the Christian church says that in marriage, the husband and wife become one, and that is generally um, not uh, anything sexist in itself. It speaks of the spiritual and we could say also emotional and practical union of two people in marriage. But in English law, according to Blackstone's own words, the husband and wife are one and that one is the husband. So uh, any legal capacity the wife might have had, any property she might have had, all her legal standing is subsumed by the husband. Now, there was also the possibility for a woman in medieval England to be a so-called femme sole, a solitary woman, an unmarried woman, uh, and then she could have legal capacity, she could run a business on her own, she could actually have relatively good legal standing, but that came with a fairly low social standing. So such women were frowned upon. It was generally in older societies, both ancient and medieval, it was generally very unusual not to get married, whether you were a man or a woman, but naturally in a society so male-dominated as medieval England, it was particularly suspicious if you were a woman living on your own, there were always some doubts whether such a woman was a prostitute, etc., etc. So there were both pros and cons for opting for such status. So to sum up, in the Middle Ages, we have a, still a very strong family and a very, very strong influence uh, of religion, and women's roles can be prominent when viewed through these lenses. So a woman can have an important position in her family. She could be of value to the church as... A believer and she could devote herself to a role of a nun. <clears throat> but on the other hand, we have the stereotype of the bad woman, the sinner, uh, of a prostitute or simply a promiscuous woman uh, who is seen both socially and legally uh, through uh, much darker lenses than a man who leads a promiscuous life. Uh, and generally, as the Middle Ages move on, women do uh, get into more and more spheres of work. So we shouldn't have um, the prejudice that in the Middle Ages, women just stayed at home and cooked lunch and took care of the babies. They also did a lot of work, sometimes work that is similar to men, so Still, we had uh, a natural economy, uh, agriculture as the dominant uh, industry, so women worked in their own fields similarly as men did. They did physically less training work, but they also took care of the family property similar to men. 
while in cities there was more segregation between men's work and women's work, so women would more often work as, uh, say, innkeepers or waitresses as inns. They would take up uh, crafts such as sewing, embroidery, uh, things that were seen as either feminine or that you needed delicate little fingers for, etc., while the things that were physically more straining but also things that were more intellectual were mostly reserved for men. And again, various interesting legal scenarios could show up here and you could have in the same society, in the same legal system, a same woman being treated equally as a man in her position. In one case, for example, as her working as a waitress in some inn, but uh, treated completely differently from a man in the similar position in a different situation, for example, if she committed adultery. That would be the end. We'll take a break now, but first, do you have any questions or comments? Everyone is tired. We'll take a 15 minute break now and we'll see you soon oh, after the, that. Dimitri right oh, Dimitria, go ahead. Oh, so oh, it's sorry. just a like, okay? Okay, <laughs> you were just waving. If, if anyone remembers a question during the break, you can uh, pose it in the chat and we'll read it out afterwards, or you can uh, remember it and raise your hand when we come back. So, coffee break for everyone. Coffee. 